Welcome, my name is Deborah Walker and I'm speaking to you from Revival from Down Under, which is a Christian church located in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne in Australia. So I'd like to welcome you today and those watching by YouTube, computer, phones, TV, whatever way you're able to be with us and join with us, uh, praise the Lord. You know, my heart is there's just one church. It's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and we're located even though we're very, very many members in every nation. Hallelujah. And God is bringing us together to be one body, one body for his glory. Hallelujah. And today I'd like to speak on a topic that I've called, Our Trust is in God. Our trust is in God. We live in times where there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of instability and things can fail and things of mankind can fail, whether they be the share market or our job situation or relationships or all manner of things, disasters, many things can impact our lives. And yet, no matter what, our trust needs to be in God. And, you know, have you ever been in situations where you actually don't know what to do? A, a situation or a dilemma has happened. You don't know what to do, which way to go, this way or that. You know, probably everyone's been in something in a different situation such as those. Just not sure what to do. And, you know, life is full of challenges and seasons. Even so, where is our trust? You know, it's a... Situations reveal what's in our heart and the way we respond to situation also reveals what's in our heart. The English, the English Oxford Dictionary says that trust is the firm belief in the reliability of someone to do what they've promised to do or said. For example, a doctor or a lawyer and even more importantly, God. God keeps his word, God performs his word, and that is a sure thing, and we can put our trust in God. So let's read God's word and see what it says. So let's open our Bibles to Psalm 61, and I'm reading from the King James Bible. You know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And when we're opening the Bible and reading our Bible and putting our eyes in our Bible and hearing it preached, it's also when we hear it in here, not just with our natural ears, but when we hear it in here, it ignites something in here. It puts a trust. It puts a, a foundation in our heart that our confidence and trust is in God. Psalm 61 verses 1 and 2 says, Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Isn't it wonderful that we can go to God in prayer? And prayer is just talking to the Lord. One on one, we can just talk to the Lord about anything. And who is the rock of our salvation? Who's the rock that's higher than you or me or any situation? Jesus is the rock. And he is the rock of our salvation. A rock is something, it's a firm place, it's stable, it's, it's rock solid, you hear that expression. Well, that's who God is and that's who God desires to be for everyone. Hallelujah. And the Amplified reads, Hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed and fainting, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Yes, a rock that is too high for me. Hallelujah. He's the rock that we can put our trust in. And verses three and four says, For there has been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. A covert is a secret place of protection. That's where God would have us to be in that secret place of protection. The Amplified says, And I will dwell in your tabernacle forever. Let me find refuge and trust in the shelter of your wings. Selah, pause and calmly think of that. Hallelujah. We can come right under God. You know, like you've seen a hen gather her chicks under her wings. The little chicks just run under and they're protected. Well, we're God's little chicks and he wants us 
under his wings of protection. It's a safe place to be. Amen. And, you know, as believers, we are never, ever alone. We read what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 28. And, of course, we know Jesus is God, the Word made flesh. Matthew 28. And just this is the very last words that were recorded, what Jesus said. So how important are they? The very last words. Matthew 28, verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. What a great promise. What a great promise. So no matter what's going on round about us, Jesus is with us. He said so in the word. Now, Jesus is not physically here, but he is here by his spirit. And he said he was with us. So hallelujah, he's with us. We are never alone. And we turn to Hebrews chapter 13. And it's confirmed here as well. Hebrews 13 and verse 5. It says, let your conversation, which is, that's an old English term, conversation. It means your behavior, your lifestyle. Be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And the Amplified, it really opens it up. Let your character and moral disposition be free from love of money, including greed, arrogance, lust and craving for earthly possessions. And be satisfied with your present circumstances and with what you have. For he... God himself has said, I will not in any way fail you or give you up nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless nor forsake nor let you down, relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. So how emphatic is that? God is absolutely saying, I will not fail you. I will not let you down. I will be with you. Hallelujah. So we truly serve a loving heavenly father. And we read what Matthew says in Matthew chapter 6. And starting in verse 25. 25 down to 34. And it reads, Therefore, and this is Jesus speaking, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought of your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet your food, net your body, what you shall put on, is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. That's Gentiles meaning the unbelievers. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil therefore thereof. Hallelujah. Take no thought for tomorrow. We only have today, in fact. We believe we're going to have tomorrow, but we only have actually right now. And Jesus is saying, 
Don't be worried about tomorrow. Don't be concerned about tomorrow. Just like I'm with you today, I'm going to be with you tomorrow. So we can just do it one day at a time. And he's a loving father to us all. And natural parents, to the best of their ability, provide and take care. They provide food and clothing for their children to the best of their ability. Loving parents will do whatever they can. How much more our heavenly father who owns everything on the planet, <laughs> who's created us, he knows how many hairs are on our head. How much more is he willing to take care of us because we are his special jewels, his prized possession. He loves us and his love is unsearchable. He'll do anything. He'll do everything because he loves us and we are his children. And he is a really loving heavenly father. And so I'm just going to read verse 33 and 34 in the Amplified Bible. It says, but seek, aim at and strive after, first of all, his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right. And then these things taken together will be given you besides. So do not worry or be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will have worries and anxieties of its own. Sufficient for each day is its own trouble. All right, we don't have to take on the whole world every single day and what's going to happen tomorrow and what's going to happen next week and next month, next year. We just do it one day at a time. And as we just put God first, that's what he's saying. That's the, if you want to put it that way, the condition, the stipulation. When we put God first and his kingdom first, then he sees that he finds that very irresistible when we put him first and then he's more than willing more than able and willing to supply every need that we will ever have hallelujah and we just do that because we put our trust in him and when we sincerely put our trust in him everything else will be taken care of he's so wonderful hallelujah and we read what jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 1. John 14 and verse 1. And this is Jesus speaking. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And the Amplified says, Do not let your hearts be troubled, distressed, agitated. You believe in and adhere to and trust in and rely on God. Believe in and adhere to and trust in and rely also on me. Hallelujah. And verse 27, it says, this is Jesus saying, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Does God doesn't want us ever to be in fear or our hearts to be troubled or anxious or overwhelmed. The Amplified says, Peace I leave with you, my own peace I now give and bequeath to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Stop allowing yourselves to be agitated and disturbed. And do not permit yourselves to be fearful and intimidated and cowardly and unsettled. Sometimes we can have thoughts, you know, that try to upset us or just the enemy can try to upset us. We do have a spiritual enemy. He will try and upset us. But if those thoughts come to us, we must just withstand them and just say, no, I'm just going to trust God. I may not have all the answers and I may not know what next week and tomorrow and next month's going to be. But God will be there just like he is today. And so if I just take one day at a time, he'll take care of all my tomorrows. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then chapter 16, verse 33, says here, Jesus saying again, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. True peace is only found in the Lord Jesus Christ. When we give our lives to him and we are, we confess our sin, we, we repent of our sins, we, we turn away from sin and turn to God, genuinely from our heart, we will receive his peace. And it's an overwhelming peace 
that you can't explain. It's a peace that resides within and it's very, very wonderful. And it's his peace. And it's available as we turn and look to him, putting our trust in him. And it says in the world you have tribulation. That word tribulation, it means anguish or to be burdened, persecuted in tribulation and trouble. So even though we're in the world and those things that are on and can be going on round about us, when we're in him, there is peace. Even we can be right in the middle of all those storms. In him, there is peace. And the Amplified says, I have told you these things so that in me, you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world, you have tribulation and trials and distress and frustration. But be of good cheer, take courage, be confident, certain, undaunted, for I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of power to harm you and have conquered it for you. So even though the enemy might try to, um, you know, frustrate us or overwhelm us or even try to destroy, you know, in God, God, Jesus has overcome and if we're in him, we too shall overcome and we'll have his peace all the way through it. Hallelujah. And we know we live in this world and there are challenges. And even so, we must still stand firm and trust God at all times. Let's read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 4. It says, So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. And the Amplified says, and this is a cause of our mentioning you with pride among the churches, assemblies of God, for your steadfastness, your unflinching endurance and patience, and your firm faith in the midst of all persecutions and crushing distresses and afflictions under which you are holding up. I mean, the church at Thessalonica, they were really going through it. I mean, really going through persecutions, getting afflicted, all manner of things. And yet they were standing firm. They were holding on. They were standing strong and, you know, facing all those distresses and facing all the anguish. And yet they were in God. They were in God and standing firm. Hallelujah. And we also read in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17, it says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And the Amplified says, For our light momentary affliction, this slight stress of the passing hour is ever more and more abundantly preparing and producing and achieving for us an everlasting weight of glory beyond all measure, excessively surpassing all comparisons and all calculations, a vast transcendent glory and blessedness never to cease. So we may go through things, but in God, nothing is without purpose. And we too are called to be overcomers. And we overcome by continuing to trust God. And God will help us navigate through situations because he's the author and finisher of our faith. He knows the end from the beginning. So when we put our trust in him, he will order our steps. Amen. And also we know in scripture, in Romans 8, 28, it says, and we know that all things work together for God. Sorry, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So when we love God, that's the condition. When we love God, even though there may be many situations we find ourselves in, God is able to bring all those little situations, those crumbs, bring them all together, those ashes and make something beautiful. Only God can do that because we might think this is a mess or this is just what this is this is terrible but because we're in god and we love him god's able to turn it all around even what the devil makes for evil god will turn it all around and make it all beautiful and wonderful and bring good out of it because sometimes we can't see the end of a situation we just can be only right in the middle of it you know maybe looking through our peephole you know we can just see just our own little mountain but you know if we sit with god in heavenly places we're above we're over and we can see better. 
So the closer we are with the Lord, we will be above and seated with him. And we won't be just looking at it through our little small scope of vision here. Right? We need to be seated with him and in him with his peace. And that's just a great place to be, sitting in his loving arms on his lap. Amen. And we also read that there will be afflictions, right? We've been looking at that. And so just in First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3, we read here that no man should be moved by these afflictions for yourselves know that we are appointed thereto. And the Amplified says that no, not one of you should be disturbed and beguiled and led astray by these afflictions and difficulties to which I have referred for you yourselves know that this is unavoidable to our position and must be recognized as our appointed lot. Our appointed lot. I'm so blessed and thankful that I live in Australia. This is my appointed lot and I am very grateful. But you know, there are other people in the world and their appointed lot is to live in very challenging positions and situations. And even those um, in China, underground church, you know, it's, uh, they're not, they don't have the freedom to speak about the Lord or gather as a church or declare the word of God. And they're put in jail and they're beaten and all manner of things happen to them. And yet that is their lot and God knows that. But they have been given a grace by God to go through and suffer those different things. And, you know, I've heard different testimonies from them and they say, they actually think it's a, a privilege to be beaten for the Lord Jesus Christ. They think it's a privilege to be able to be sent to jail, just like Paul and Silas sent to jail on behalf of Jesus Christ because they won't bow. They will not bow. They will only bow to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is their lot. And, and unfortunately, over the time, you know, some people have even suffered martyrdom down through the years. And yet, absent from the body is present with the Lord. And they all receive their reward because they stood true to the end of their life. And you know, it's not how we start our walk in God, ever. We're not in a sprint, we're in a marathon, and we just do it day by day by day until we get to the finish line. And no one knows when our finish line is individually. We believe we're in the end times and we will be here alive until Jesus comes. Even so, God knows every life and he knows what's ahead. And so if we're in him, we'll be in the right place at the right time. Hallelujah. And so, as I said, it's not how we start our walk with God. It's how we finish it. And we need to be up to date with the Lord every single day and finish strong in the Lord. Finish strong in him. Stronger than how we even may have started. Strong in him. Full of faith. Looking to the Lord and fully trusting him. Amen. And so scripture tells us what we're to do in these times. If we go through afflictions, we are to trust, believe and pray to the Lord to bring us through every situation. Hallelujah. In James chapter 5, verse 13, just after Hebrews, James chapter 5, verse 13, it says, Is any among you afflicted? That means like tested and tried. Let him pray. Let him pray. And the Amplified says, Is any ma anyone among you afflicted, ill-treated, suffering evil? He should pray. He should pray. <laughs> it doesn't say complain. It doesn't say fight back. It says pray. And if we turn back to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 1, we read here, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and longed for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. And the Amplified says, Therefore, my brethren, whom I love and yearn to see, my delight and crown, wreath of victory, thus stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Stand firm. So we're not falling over. We're not giving up. We're not quitting. We're exhorted to stand firm hallelujah and verse six and seven it says be careful for nothing 
but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And the Amplified says, do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. Isn't that great? Do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. But in every circumstance and in everything, by prayer and petition, definite requests, with thanksgiving, continue to make your wants known to God. And God's peace shall be yours, that tranquil state of soul assured of its salvation through Christ. And so fearing nothing from God and being content with its earthly lot of whatever sort that is, that peace which transcends all understanding shall garrison and mount guard over your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's a peace that guards our heart and our mind. Sometimes we can get, you know, the enemy can just really have a muddle going on in our heart. What about this? What about this? And he wants us to get worrying about what about this? What about, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? But the Lord's saying to us, we don't have to even take that on. If we just keep putting our petitions to the Lord, going to the Lord, trusting in the Lord, God will make a way and he'll lead us through. Hallelujah. And First Peter chapter 5 First Peter chapter 5 and verses, starting verse 7 to 9, it says, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. So we're casting our cares on the Lord. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. All right, so we're not alone. There's other people going through things. But that first exhortation was, verse 7, casting all your cares upon him. All right, when I was young, my loving father, dad, he used to take me fishing with my brother and cousins. And we'd get the fishing rod out and we'd put these little metal fish, they called them spinners, on the hook on the end there and we'd tie them on and then we'd uh, go down to the brook, the, the river, and then we would cast out the spinner right out to the far side, right out as far as we possibly could. And the spinner would sink and it would stay there until we reeled it back in. But that casting out there, it went so far out that you didn't see the spinner anymore out of sight and you know that's exactly what God wants us to do he wants us to cast our cares cast any worries cast any thoughts of anxiousness onto him and just leave them with him not like a fisherman who then wheels them all back in and wheels all our worries and anxiousness back in no God wants us to cast it out and leave them with him Sounds a much better idea, don't you think? You know, and you know, Jesus even said, come unto him all those who are weary and heavy laden, like burdened, and I will give you rest. Cast your burdens upon him and he'll give us rest. You know, we can give everything we have to him. We're not meant to be carrying the burdens. We're not, we're not meant to. Jesus said, he's the burden bearer. So we're to cast everything onto him. And let him work in our lives, go before us, make a way, fight our battles, help us navigate through. If he wants us to speak to this person or go down here, whatever he'd have us to do, let's do what he says. But nothing more and nothing less. Not our own plan and we're going to sort that person out or we're going to do this or that. We just want to let God lead and guide us. Amen. And so... That scripture also says we have a spiritual enemy and even though, even though there may be spiritual opposition, we're still to cast our cares, our situations to the Lord, all right? And that means we are really putting our trust in him. 
when we're trying to work it out and sort it out, our trust is in ourself. But if we give it to the Lord, it clearly shows that our trust is in him. And just leave it with him and let him undertake. Hallelujah. And did I read that in the Amplified? It says in verse 7, Casting the whole of your care, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all on him. For he cares for you affectionately and cares about you watchfully. Be well balanced, temperate, sober of mind. Be vigilant and cautious at all times. For that enemy of yours, the devil, right? That's very clear who the enemy is. It's not that person or that manager. It's the devil. Roams about like a lion roaring in fierce hunger, seeking someone to seize upon and devour. Withstand him. Be firm in faith against his onslaught. Rooted, established, strong, immovable and determined. Knowing that the same identical sufferings are appointed to your brother, your brotherhood, the whole body of Christians throughout the world. You know, we may have situations and it may be with people, but scripture says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. And often the enemy can stir a person up, you know, to maybe try and have a go at any of us. And so we mustn't come against that person, right? What we do is we take authority over what's um, influencing that person so we have we have we can do prayers of authority Jesus has given us authority and we can also even pray for that person you know rather than be against that person because Jesus said love your enemies we can pray for that person you know you don't take that as a challenge we might be the only person who's ever prayed for that person so you know we can pray to God about people about situations and just let God work in situations. And look, I've seen him do amazing things throughout my life when situations have been way beyond me and I've not known what to do or how to go about it. And, you know, God has undertaken for me. You know, I have never had to fight a battle, my own battle. I'm, firstly, I'm a peacemaker. But I will go to God and that's where I'll do the battle. I'll do the battle on my knees, praying. Praying in English, praying in the Holy Spirit, giving thanks to God that he's going to bring me through and he's going to resolve the situation. Hallelujah. Let my prayers be made with thanksgiving. So thank you, Lord, for helping me in this situation. Thank you, Lord. You're showing me the way to get this, get through this and resolve this. Thank you, Lord. My confidence, my trust is in you. Thank you, Lord. You're big enough to sort this out and I'm believing and trusting you. So my eyes are on the Lord, not on myself. It's just a much easier way to live your Christian walk, I've found anyway. And then we see in James chapter 4 and verse 7, it says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. So that's the first thing, submit yourselves to God. Then it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The Amplified says, so be subject to God, resist the devil, stand firm against him and he will flee from you. If we just stand firm and resist and just keep standing strong and just be believing God, the situation will change. God will intervene. The devil will leave off. Absolutely, he will leave off because he'll think, oh, this is, I'll go and try and get an easier target. You know, not that we wish that on anyone, but we're all growing and we're all going to be tested. And as we grow and are tested and we overcome, and we see the victory and then we go on to the next situation. Hello. And we just go from glory to glory as we go through the tests and keep getting the victories. Amen. And, you know, as believers, when we put our trust in God, he will be. Now I'm going to give you a list of who he's going to be. He will be our healer. Our Redeemer, our Provider, our Shield, our Protector, our Strength, our Defender, our High Tower, our Deliverer, 
our refuge, our financier, and, the, and give us favour. We find God is our healer in Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. God is more than those things, but that's certainly some of, some of his attributes. Exodus 15, verse 26. And it says here, just the last bit, it says, well, I'll read the whole scripture. And the Lord said, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. I am his present tense. Jesus Christ, we you know, we read in Acts 10, 38, he went about doing good and healing all. He demonstrated God's love by healing all. And God is the same. Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. He has not changed. And that's what he desires to do. For I am the Lord that heals thee. And so when we look to him and believe and we're in faith, it's not hope. We need to be in faith. And faith comes by hearing the word. And God responds to faith. Not wishful thinking, not a hope. It's got to be faith. Hallelujah. And we also read in Psalm 103. Psalm 103. Verses 2 to 5. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. So serving God comes with benefits. And some of those benefits we just read before. Who forgives all thine iniquities. Who heals all thy diseases. Who redeems thy life from destruction. Who crowns thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfies thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagle. He's so wonderful, so wonderful. Our lives were being destroyed, but you know, it says it's the goodness of God that brought us through to repentance. And so he, he drew, drew us to himself. And so instead of our lives being destroyed, he's redeemed our life from destruction. Hallelujah. So redemption is a benefit. Healing is a benefit. His loving kindness is a benefit. His mercy is is a benefit and so on and these benefits come to us by believing what God has said and obeying what's in his word hallelujah obeying his voice and that is his word hallelujah and let's turn back to Psalm 5 and verse 11 and 12 it says but let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice let them ever shout for joy because thou defendest them let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee, right? He is our defender. We don't have to put the boxing gloves on. We just need to allow him to be our defender. Amen. And verse 9, sorry, chapter 9, verse 9 and 10. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, has not forsaken them that trust, that seek thee. All right. A refuge in time of trouble. So he's not saying we're not going to be without trouble. But he's our place of refuge in time of trouble. And he's not going to forsake us. As we seek him, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. All right. We just keep seeking him, putting him first. Amen. And Psalm 18, verse 2, that says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Oh, that's just such a great scripture. A buckler is a shield for protection, but he's a fortress. Do you remember those uh, old movies where they had the castles? And people, you know, the enemy was trying to lay siege and they were in the castles and they had high towers. And if you were in the castle and in the high tower, nobody was coming in. You were in a safe place and a high tower, you're up nice and high and the enemy can't even get up there. You know, he can't even, you know, he's going to fail. And so if we're in God and he's the high tower, our place of refuge, our fortress, our fortress, the enemy's not going to get in. 
all right? But we need to be inside. If we're on the outside of the castle, if those people were on the outside of the castle, well, then they were usually destroyed. But only those that were inside the castle, inside the tower, were absolutely kept safe. And that's where God wants us to be, in him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And uh, Psalm 18, verse 30, it says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. Remember that buckler is again, it's a, a shield for protection. He's our protector. He's our protector. And the word of the Lord is tried. So as we receive more of the word, this is just how it works. As we receive more of the word, we're going to get tested on that. Just like when we went to school, you know, we were in year seven or eight and we'd have to learn some, whatever we learned that year. And then we have tests, didn't we? And if we pass the test, we would be promoted to the next grade, to the next level. Well, it's the same in God. We will go through different tests. We will get the word and then we will get tested to see if we've really understood the word. Did we really understand it? But fortunately in God, there are no failures. He doesn't want us to fail. And if we don't pass the test the first time, just like in days of school, if, if you didn't pass, for whatever reason, you, you repeated the year. Well, in God, if we don't, you know, catch on the first time in the test and we fail the test, we, we don't do too well, um, no failures. God will just let us go around the mountain again and sit the test again. What we should be concerned about is if we keep seeing the same test coming our way, we're missing something and we need to call out to the Lord and say, Lord, please show me. What is it that you're wanting to change me? Because you're basically the tests are what's going to change us, not the people or the situations coming through. God's wanting to change us into his glory, into his likeness. And I'll say it, Jesus was the Lamb of God. And in the natural, everyone can touch a lamb. An adult can touch, if I had a lamb here in my arms, a, an adult could touch a lamb. An elderly person could touch a lamb. A child could touch a lamb. A lamb just doesn't react. Just doesn't react. A lamb doesn't respond, doesn't react, just goes, bah. And that is how God would have us to be, that our nature would be like his as a lamb. It doesn't rah, it doesn't arc up, it doesn't react. It just remains peaceable and keeps trusting in God. And that's a work of the God by his word and by his spirit allowing his nature to come forth more and more. And the more we are in him, the more his character will be developed in us. Hallelujah. 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 So we're just going to keep trusting him. And it says, the Lord is our strength and our provider, and we can put our trust in him. That's Psalm 28. Let's look at that. Psalm 28. And verse 7, it says, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusteth in him. I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth. And with my song, I will praise him. Hallelujah. He's, my, he's our strength and our heart trusts in him. And then we get helped. When we just keep put trusting in him, we're going to help. But I think I missed something off back on that um, earlier scripture. Was it... Um, well, maybe it's still coming up. I'm thinking about no good thing. In fact, it's probably coming up. Actually, it is. So just um, Psalm 34, Psalm 34, verse 9, it says, O fear the Lord, O ye saints. That's have a reverence for the Lord, O ye saints. For there is no want to them that fear him. Isn't that wonderful? No want. God said he would supply our needs. Hallelujah. And he even delights in our wants because he knows what, what we'd like. You know, my natural parents, they would say, what would you like for your birthday or for Christmas? And I would say, well, I would like or I want. <laughs> I would like whether it was a doll or some roller skates or something that, you know, that would give me a lot of pleasure. And to the best of their ability, they always provided that. Now, we weren't really, we weren't rich as you would say some people are, but they would always do their best and it might be just one gift or whatever it was 
but they never disappointed me. And so I'm really glad about that because when I came to the Lord, it made it very easy for me to just slip over into believing God because I understood what a natural loving father was like, that it was very easy to then go to understand in a very strong way what a loving heavenly father would be like. But I do understand that people have all had different family and upbringings and situations. And even so, and hearts get broken and lives get damaged, but Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. So through it all, Jesus said, I'll, you know, God said, I'll give you beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning. And he's the one that heals the brokenhearted. So as we just stay in him, God will bring about beauty for some ashes that we may have experienced in our life. And he will be glorified through it because he will work all things together for good because he said he would. Even though we don't understand how he could possibly do that, but he said he would. So we've just got to trust him at that. And Psalm 34 verse 22, it says, The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. None shall be desolate. And that word desolate means destroyed or punished. So when we trust in him, we're not going to be destroyed or receive any punishments. Hallelujah. And how often are we to trust God? Psalm 62, verse 5, sorry, Psalm 62, verse 8. It says, trust in him at all times. That's pretty clear, isn't it? All times, you people, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. How many times have we heard refuge in this teaching? A refuge. And Psalm 91, verse 2. Psalm 91 is a wonderful passage, isn't it? Verse 2, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him I will trust. What we say is very important. Are we saying that we're going to trust God? Are we saying that he's our refuge? Are we saying that he's our helper? Or are we just saying what situation we're in and how it's, what's going on? You know, our words are very powerful. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. And so we need to speak words that agree with God's word. So thank you, Lord. You are my my refuge lord you are my fortress in this situation and lord i'm just going to with your help i'm just going to continue to put my trust in you hallelujah hallelujah and we can put our trust in god because god says to do it and he says for us to do it and god wouldn't ask us to do something we couldn't do so we can trust him hallelujah and psalm 84 this was the scripture i was going to go for before psalm 84 and it says in verse 11 and 12 for the Lord our God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. Okay, no good thing will the Lord withhold from them that walk uprightly. Some people are very determined. I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. I, and, and they just want this. But you know, God is all knowing. And he sees the end from the beginning. And he knows what is good for us and what is not good for us. We might think, oh, we, we want all of this or this and this and this. And God knows that would be the very ruin of us because he knows our hearts. He knows us through and through. And so when we're in our walk with the Lord, you know, we do have, he does say he'll give us the desires of our heart, but usually it's because he's put those desires there. And so we just tread softly with the Lord and we walk a walk of faith and believing God, knowing that God's not going to give us bad things. And he's, going to, and he's always going to give us good things that are good for us. All right. And so if there's a good thing that's for us, then it's going to come to pass. All right. And we do want God to keep the bad things away in spite of ourselves. Lord, just help me. Just only get the good things that you say are good. All right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we know in Philippians 4.19, but my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He's a wonderful heavenly father and he's only too willing to supply our needs. Hallelujah. Let's turn to Proverbs chapter 3. I was just thinking then sometimes people with their uh, needs and so forth you know i want it now 
you know, the guy might be just checking on the attitude. Uh, are we good? Are we good waiters? Can we wait patiently, or do we kick up a fuss and stamp our feet and stamp our, you know, react and so forth? You know, God will supply our needs, but He also wants our character to be becoming more like Him. Hallelujah. I've never seen a lamb jump up and down and stomp his foot and stomp his hand. You know, lambs just go bah. You know, there's such a delight. Hallelujah. So Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1, it says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Hallelujah. And verses 4 and 5, and in fact, I'll read 6 as well. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Doesn't that sound good? Favor in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. So we're not to try and we don't have to work it all out. Our own understanding. Leaning, oh, I'll work it out. I'll work it out. This is the plan. This is my plan. God, would you bless it? This is my plan. No, it's Lord, I give yourself, I give myself to you. Lord, you've got the best plan. Help me just to flow with your plan. I want to be in the right place at the right time. Lord, it's all going to unfold for your glory. And so he's, as we acknowledge him in every situation, you know, Lord, shall I take this job or this job? Lord, giving, putting it before God. God will then order our steps. We'll have a piece about this one, but not a piece about that one. Or, you know, this house or that house or this situation or this or, you know, a lot of that decision making we go through. If there's no peace, then just wait. No peace could be there's a timing in it or no peace could be that's not God's best for you. And if you'll just wait a little longer, God might have something just around the corner. So that peace of God that we read about earlier, it acts as an umpire in our hearts. And so sometimes, I don't know if you've ever had this, but I have. Um, about a situation God wanted me to do something and I had a peace in my heart here. However, my mind had all sorts of ideas and what about this and what about that and, and could see pitfalls or, or situations or possibities and so I'd lose my peace and I'd go back to the Lord and I'd say, Lord, you know, what should I do in this situation? And I'd feel the Lord would say, we'll do this and I'd have a peace of God and then the thoughts in my head would try and talk me out of it again. Long story short, I sort of went, okay, I'm just going to trust God. I'm just going to trust God. I'm not sure. I'm going to not worry about my understanding or my head in this situation, in this particular situation. And I just went with that peace of God. And it was the best decision I'd ever made, as it turned out. But I had to get it in God. Because God does care about the decisions we make and the important decisions, you know, little decisions. Shall I have tea and coffee? He's not worried about it or juice or water. He's not worried about it. But sometimes in our big decision making, you know, we need to go to him because he knows the end from the beginning. It's a safe way to live our lives in him. Amen. And so we've read that. And so let's turn to Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3. And verse 11, 11 and 12, it says, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, so this is all the things that you can see, he's saying, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation or holy behavior and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the Lord, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Okay, and the Amplified says, while you wait and earnestly long for, sorry, verse 11, isn't it? 11 and 12. Since all these things are thus in the process of being dissolved, what kind of person ought each of you be in the meanwhile, in consecrated and holy behavior and devout and qu godly qualities? While you wait and earnestly long for, expect and hasten the coming of the day of the God by reason of which the flaming heavens will be dissolved and the material elements of the universe will flare and melt with fire. All right, there's a few things in there. Jesus said he's coming back in flaming fire. So the things that we get concerned about, they're all going to perish. 
There's nothing in this world that's not going to be perished and burn up. But until that time, it says, what should our behavior be? And it says it should be godly and it should be holy. You know, God's standards have not changed and God ordained marriage. And I'll say it, that's where sexual relationships should be in marriage and only in marriage, not before marriage, not outside of marriage, God ordained marriage and marriages need God in them. He, God is the only one that can blend two individual people to becoming one and not just a physical union. It's a union of oneness, spirit, soul and body. All right. Not just physical. It's a union that God does. And so marriages need God to bring that unity. And there's an exhortation for husbands that if you're not in unity, if you're in strife with your wife, your prayers are going to be hindered. It says that. I don't have that scripture right in front of me, but I read it um, yesterday. If husbands don't have, if they are in strife, it's not going to go well because God is in unity and God blesses unity. So, and we are to walk in unity amongst, even with amongst ourselves, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So we need to have unity in our marriages, unity in our relationships, unity in our church, unity in our job situations, wherever we are. We're the peacemakers and we desire to walk in unity. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so Jesus is coming right back on time. And everything's going to melt. Except people. Those that are alive and remain will be caught up and meet him in the air. Hallelujah. But everybody else? So now's the time for people to turn to the Lord. Amen. And, you know, we need to be planted in God's house and stand strong and keep standing and keep trusting God. Hallelujah. It's for his glory. And let's turn back to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. And we read here, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And that word confident comes the same Greek word as trust. So being trusting of this very thing, all right? Being confident of this very thing. And the Amplified says, And I am convinced and sure of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will continue until the day of Jesus Christ, right up to the time of his return, developing that good work and perfecting and bringing it to full completion in you. That is God's plan for each one of our lives to finish the work that he started. He's a wonderful potter and we're the clay and we need to stay in his hand. However, if we decide to just, I'm over this, I'm going out here, I'm going to go do this, I'm going to do that, you potentially are going to miss out on the most exciting things that could have ever happened in your life and you might even miss eternity if you, if you actually walk right away from God and do not return to God, you could miss everything, you could miss heaven. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. And I was just, uh, what just came to me then was, you know, some people, uh, well, this is, this is the example that's just come to me. Some people might be in God, but then they see a person whom they're not married to. They may belong to somebody else's spouse, or they may just see somebody who's just in the street and get caught up in a relationship with them just to satisfy something, a lust of their eyes, a lust of their flesh, and for a moment's pleasure. There is no one on this planet worth spending eternity in hell over. The Bible calls it fornication, having sexual relationships outside of marriage. And we're only, to, we're only ever supposed to have sexual relationships with the person we are married to. If a married person has sexual relationships with somebody else other than their married partner, their spouse, that's called adultery. And no adulterers are going to heaven. No fornicators are going to heaven. No liars and cheats are going to heaven. God's word's really true. And the only way any of us, because it's sin, but there is none. We've all had sin. There is no one perfect and there is no grades of sin. Sin is sin. 
White lie is a sin. Every lie is a sin. Every deceit, every dishonest way, every falsehood is a sin. And what must we do? Repent. Repent. Confess it to God. Ask him to take it out of our heart and help us, ask him not, help us not to do it again. All right? Bring forth fruit of repentance. Let your lifestyle show that you're not doing that stuff anymore. You're not interested. You're saying no, no, no to that temptation. No, it's not worth costing your relationship with God. Because what if that was your last moment? What if that was your last day? You know, because some disasters can happen in a blink. And you might have been in God for many, many years. And just that one moment you decide to just go left field for a bit. And what if that was your last day? As I said, it's not how you start to walk in God, it's how you finish. It's really important that we stay in God and stay strong in God and keep trusting God. And then Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, it's really important what we spend our time thinking on. Verse 8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, Whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. They're good things to think on, aren't they? Let's read it from the Amplified. For the rest, brethren, what's, whatsoever is true, whatsoever is worthy of reverence and is honourable and seemly, whatsoever is just, whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is lovely and lovable, whatever is kind and winsome and gracious, if there is any virtue and excellence, there is, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on and weigh and take account of these things. Fix your minds on them. All right, so we want to fix our minds, our thought life. Our thought life is really important because God even knows what we're thinking. And, you know, Jesus, he even said, for those that even do the very act, he said, if you even think it, it's as if you've done it. So our... Everything in our life needs to be absolutely pure and holy. Everything. Everything. And so, and, and we can't even fix ourselves up. God's given us his word to lead and guide and strengthen us and show us his ways. And his word washes our hearts, washing the water by the word. And so we need lots of word to just keep our heart washed. And that's why we need to be in God, hearing the word, gathering the word every day keeping feeding our spiritual man so he stays strong hallelujah so our thoughts in that scripture our thoughts and our trust need to be towards god hallelujah thank you lord hallelujah and just the last scripture is philippians chapter 19 sorry psalms chapter 19 psalm chapter 19 and verse 14 it says let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. The Amplified says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, the things we're thinking about, things we're dwelling on, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my firm, impenetrable, impenetrable rock and my redeemer. Hallelujah. He's our rock. And if we're in him, He's strong rock. Hallelujah. You know, the foolish man built his house on the sand and when it got tested and everything, the testings came and it fell. And the wise man built his house on the rock. He had the same testings, but his house stood firm. So we need to make sure that our lives are built on the rock. Hallelujah. And so in summary, God is our rock and he has given his word so that we can put our trust in in God and in his word. And everyone said, Amen.